couple of weeks ago, we were doing our series called Rhythms, and I was talking about spiritual temperaments. And I used an illustration to open that series up, and I want to continue that illustration and go back and just remind you, because kind of what I want to do today is, is we're closing this series out on spiritual rhythms. I want to help you be, begin to synthesize some of these spiritual temperaments that we talked about. We talked about nine spiritual temperaments, and I want you to begin to synthesize this and know how to adapt these to your life. Um, I gave the story in talking about two men who decided that they wanted to plant a garden. So they both went to the store, to the local store, and got seeds. They got things to plant the garden with. They got hoses to be able to water the garden, and they went out and prepared a place. They prepared the soil, and they planted the seeds, and they began to grow a garden. One of the men went, and he, he was extra, all right? So he went, and he got cages to put around some of the plants to keep birds away. He got um, things so that the, the tomato plants could grow up and protect them. He, he just took care of it. He tended his, his garden, and he would go out, and he would look at the garden and make sure that, that uh, it was watered prepared, that it was watered correctly, and he just took care of it. The other farmer didn't. He planted his garden, and he walked away, and several months later, he came back to reap the harvest, to take the vegetables off, to check on his garden and see how it was. Well, when he came back, he found ground that was hard. He found plants that some of them had grown up, but there were more weeds and there were more grasses and different things than his plants. Some of the plants that did yield fruit, the animals had come in and eaten the fruit or eaten the plants, and his garden was a mess. And he just decided it's better for me to just buy it at the grocery store than to have to put all this work into tending this garden because it's just not worth it. The other farmer was a totally different story. He went out almost daily and checked on his garden. He took care of the plants. He made sure that it had the right amount of water. He made sure that the animals were keeping off the plants and they had a chance to grow. If there were weeds or, or anything coming up, he would pull those and get those out of the way. He tended his garden, and his garden grew up beautiful and lush, and the fruit was delicious, and it saved him money, and it took care of the needs of his family. Totally two different situations. Both of them got the seeds at the same place. Both of them had access to the same water. Both of them had the same sunlight, the same ground. The difference was is that one tended his garden, and the other one didn't. This morning, when we talk about spiritual temperaments, what I want you guys to understand is this. It is more important to tend your spiritual garden than to simply plant your spiritual garden. Anybody can plant it. When you come to church on Sunday mornings, we're planting seeds inside of you. We're helping you plant your spiritual garden. We're telling you, plant it here, plant it here, plant it here. We're giving you that instruction to plant that. But going away during the week, it is up to you to tend that garden. If you only plant on Sundays and you never tent, you never tend the garden, what's going to happen is thorns and thistles and weeds are going to come in and destroy your garden. The animals and the birds and the, the, field, the, 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 the things around are going to come in. They're going to, they're going to destroy your garden and take advantage of you and begin to eat and destroy what you have. This morning, I want to tell you that the most important thing you can do after you've planted is to tend that garden and make sure that your spiritual garden is in good condition and it's growing and it's protected. The last couple of weeks, we've talked about this spiritual rhythms and we've talked about these spiritual temperaments. I gave nine of them. If you didn't get that, you can go back in this series either on YouTube or, or on our website and you can get those messages. We've got those out there and you can go completely through those and listen to those yourself. But we talked about nine temperaments. Let me list them for you and they'll scroll them on the screen here. The naturalist, the sensate, the traditionalist, the ascetic, the activist, the caregiver, the enthusiast, the contemplative, and the intellectual. I've had a lot of fun these past couple of weeks saying, hey, what's your spiritual temperaments? And I get people, wow, throwing on this and this and part of this and part of this. And I haven't had anybody say none. I'm not any of those because we're all probably some of those. But I, I like going in and looking at those temperaments and just trying to decide where we're at in that kind of stuff. And I commend you guys for just listening and, and adapting this stuff to your life. But once we've figured out what kind of temperament that we have, it's imperative for us to know how to apply 
that knowledge to our lives and how we can grow in those temperaments and how we develop those temperaments. So I want to spend just a little bit of time this morning talking to you about that. I want to give you a couple of rules for engaging or keeping these spiritual temperaments going. And here's the first one, identify and unite. The first one is identify and unite. Find what your spiritual temperament is and then use that spiritual temperament. Learn how to synthesize that spiritual temperaments together. Know how to synthesize those and put those things together. By synthesize, I just mean combine them. Know how to unite those. Let me give you an example. For me, I think my top temperaments are naturalist, ascetic, and enthusiast. Those, those are probably my top three. And so because of that, I have to purposefully tend to my spiritual garden. I have to purposefully make sure that I have scheduled in my day or in my week a time that I can get into nature. I, I, I love being in nature. And so I have to schedule a time that I can find a park that I can walk in, that I can go play a round of golf or that I can go out in the country or go fishing or do something that's outdoors where I can experience God. That is the way that I connect, one of the strongest ways I connect. So I've got to plan that. I, I'm an ascetic, so I, I love the quiet. I love being around nature and the beautiful things of nature. I love time that I can just sit and sometimes I'll get in my, in early in the morning on my way to work, I'll pull over somewhere at a beautiful location. Sometimes I'll sit down here at St. Francis uh, South. They have such beautiful gardens there. And I'll just sit in the parking lot in the quietness with my Bible and I can sit and collect my thoughts and think, plan my day. That's just the way I, I connect. And so I have to make those times that I can plan. Or an enthusiast. The enthusiast in me likes to get on YouTube and listen to videos or listen to preaching. I love listening to guys like T.D. Jakes and old Walter Hawkins videos and hearing music. Uh, uh, Yolanda Adams is one of my favorite. I love hearing that music and I love being inspired by that. But I have to plan my day and plan those into my week because I have to tend to my spiritual garden. Does that make sense to you? So whatever your spiritual temperaments are, List those things out and then begin to desire and put within the schedule of your day, how do I implement these into my day? Don't just focus on one of them at a time. Sometimes you can say, well, I'm a naturalist, so I'm going to only worship God. I'm going to forget all the rest of them. If you do, you will become like some nature person out in the woods and no one will ever see you. But use the things that you have and Find out what your things are and then use them in synthesis with each other. Combine them together. Now, in, in a church situation, I realize that we may have uh, tendencies to be one way or another. And if you're looking for the church that has your specific temperaments, you'll never find it. Nor is it, imp nor is it healthy for a church to just have one spiritual temperament. We are just going to be enthusiasts and we're going to throw everything else out the window. I don't think it's a healthy situation. But we in our service try to do things that communicate. We try to in, involve the senses. We try to involve uh, the, the, the naturalist part. And we try to involve the tradition part. We try to involve the ascetic and the sensate and all these different things. We try to have some elements in the service where we can connect with you on that. And I'm telling you, Mark, wherever he's at, this morning was, was wonderful. Worship was was another level this morning. Don't you, agree? Don't you agree? It was extra. I'm learning. I'm learning. Help me. It was, it was fantastic where he's at. I, I really thought they did a great job. But by doing this and combining these things together, we want to meet the needs of the people who are in our congregation. Number two is this. Be tolerant. Be tolerant of other people's temperaments. Don't just say, this is my spiritual temperament and I'm not that spiritual temperament and no one should be that spiritual temperament. But understand that all of us connect to God in some different way. And what you, the way you connect may not be the temperament that other people connect. And don't look down on other people because they have a different preference than what you do. It's impossible. It's impossible for everybody to operate in all those temp Well, I don't say it's impossible. It may be possible, unlikely for people to operate in all those temperaments. But here's the danger. Please, please, please. Don't think because your temperament is something and someone else's temperament is something else that your temperament is better than theirs or theirs is better than yours or that yours is this way and everybody else is wrong. Please don't do that. That's just arrogance and it's just not working. 
Let's be tolerant of what other people have and the way they connect with God and understand that each of us have to find how we connect with God and understand that me spending time outdoors is just as important as you being in a church service or you being in, 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 in a uh, worship event. Now, when I was in college, I can remember going through times of, of talking about how we would do our devotions. And, and I always, you know, I, I had a friend of mine who he would pray on his way to school. When he got in the car, he would pray on his way to school because he had about a 30 minute drive. And that's what he did. He would spend his time in prayer. And I can think, I remember thinking to myself, that's not prayer. You're driving. Prayer is when you're somewhere and you're spitting and you're throwing, you know, and you're naming things and rebuking demons and getting authority. And that, that's, that's what prayer is. Man, prayer is getting in a quiet spot somewhere with your Bible and, and, you know, reading that Bible and spending time with God in two or three hours a day. Man, that's what prayer is. I don't know what you're doing and you're driving to work, but that's not prayer. That's wrong. That's, that, I can't have that attitude. Because the way you connect with God is just as valid as the way I connect with God. But here's the thing. Don't use your way of connecting with God as an excuse to not connect with him. Okay? Make sure that you connect with him in some form or fashion. So let's make sure that we're, we're tolerant of what other people have and, and how they're connecting with God. But the important thing is, is that you have to tend to your garden. Are you guys with me this morning? Okay, Philippians, the third chapter. I want to read a portion of scripture here. I want to show you a little bit of how Paul tends his garden and how Paul uses the experiences of his life and, and connects with those kind of things. So I, I want you to look here in Philippians, the third chapter, and we're going to start reading right in the third verse, Philippians 3.3. 3. Here's what it says. Let me back up just a little bit. I'm going to read a large portion of this scripture. Let's just start at the first chapter or the first verse. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard to you. Watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those manipulators of the flesh. Let me just stop and explain that a little bit. The Judaizers of the time and Paul's time. Number one, they called the Gentiles dogs. Even Jesus called the Gentiles dogs. Remember, he said, it's not right for me to take the bread that was meant for the children and throw it to the dogs. He was talking to a Gentile lady. That was what they typically called the Gentiles because they looked down upon them so much, especially the Samaritans. So what Paul is doing here, he's reversing that. And he's saying, watch out for those dogs, th those men of evil who mutilate the flesh. Mutilate in this, in this phrase, and it goes on and talks about circumcision, Circumcision actually means to mutilate in, in the raw form of that word. But what these Judaizers were saying was that for you to really be saved, yes, you could be saved, but you also had to be circumcised. So it was faith plus something else that got you to heaven. It was faith plus what you did, your actions. And Paul came back and says, no, 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 it's not that. It's not faith, something else. Now, God gave us that commandment, and, and obviously Scripture talks about that. But what Paul said, what's even more important than, than outward circumcision is circumcision of the heart. When he's talking about cutting away of the things that aren't needed in our lives and our hearts. So Paul is jumping a little bit more into theology. I just, I hate reading scriptures and I don't want to know what they mean and I don't want to project those to you unless I know what they mean and so I can communicate those onto you. Verse number three, for it is we who are the circumcised, we who worship in the spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. That's what he's talking about, this circumcision. Don't put confidence in the things you do. Put confidence in who you are inside. Though I may have reason to have such confidence, Paul speaking. Listen to this. For anyone else, if anyone else thinks he has reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. And what Paul's just saying here, he's giving a little bit of boasting in himself. He's just saying, listen, if anybody has room or has an ability to, to, to boast on what they are and what they've accomplished, I've got it. Because look at me. Um, I, I'm, I, I'm from the right tribe. I'm from the right part of town. I grew up in the right church. I grew up in the right family. I've been trained by the best there is. He goes on. He goes on here and says... Um, in regards to the law, a Pharisee. 
In other words, he's saying, in regards to me keeping the law, I'm a Pharisee. I'm the highest ruling uh, member of that religious body who kept the law, who knows what the scriptures are. I went to seminary. I got degrees. I've already proved that I am a man of God, is what he's saying here. A Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church. As for zeal, he's saying, I went out there. I picketed. I mean, Here's, the, here's the, the demonstration part of him. I, I went out there and I picketed. I, I was the one that was leading the charge. I showed, not just with my mouth, that I was for the cause of, of religion and, and what we believed in, but I went out and fought for it. I, I did that. Let's, let's keep going. Look at this next thing. Persecuting church. As for legalistic righteousness, faultless. If Paul stopped right here, I would think that he's an arrogant snot and I wouldn't run to read him. As for legalistic righteousness, in other words, he's saying, as for righteousness that came by being good and being perfect and being the perfect kid at church and being the perfect pastor and my hair always being in place and always looking the right way and always being in the right places, as for that, I'm faultless. You can't find any fault in me. I'm perfect in that order. And he's just, he's saying, I, I, got, it, I got it all going on. For everybody to look at me, they would think, man, he is the perfect guy. He's got the perfect family. He comes from the perfect background. Everything perfect. But let me look. Let, let me continue to hear what, what Paul says. Verse number seven. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. Paul's just saying here, listen, everything that I've gained, all my accomplishments, everything I've done, when it comes to Christ, he's not impressed. I throw all those things away. It brings no merit to Christ. In other words, Christ doesn't look at me and say, wow, here, look at this guy. He's, he, he's accomplished a lot. Man, he is going to be valuable in my kingdom. This guy, I'm lucky to have him. That's not what Christ said. Christ looks at every one of us and sees value in every one of us. It doesn't matter what family we come from, how much money we got in our pocket, what color our skin is, where we're from. It don't matter. Christ sees every one of us as the same, and he sees every one of us as valuable. He doesn't see any more value in anybody else. He sees the same value in all of you. And let me tell you, you can never do anything to impress Christ, nor could you ever do anything to make him want to take his love away from you. He loves you the very same. He loves you the very same. And his righteousness is available to you in all these situations. And that's what Christ is trying to convey to these guys here. Let me just talk about these real quickly. Number one, as we see in the first part of this passage, we see that Paul's life had been transformed. We see that. Paul says, hey, listen, I was the Jew of Jews. I was the, I was the Pharisee of Pharisees. I did everything perfect. I was the perfect candidate. There was an arrogance. There was an authority. There was who he was. But he says, but there was some transition that happened in my life. And now I come to that understanding to know that I throw all of that away for Christ. How did Paul get to that point? Well, I'll tell you how he got to that point. The scripture talks about Paul was on his way to, to a place called Damascus. He was on this road, and as he was out on that road, he had an experience with Jesus Christ. Scripture says he was on this road breathing threats and, and insults against God, against the people of God. He, he was out there mulling it over in his mind. How am I going to get these Christians? How am I going to kill them? I can't believe that they're this way. I can't believe that they're standing up against what we believe in. And he was, he was breathing insults and threats to Jesus and to the kingdom of what Jesus had established on this road. And all of a sudden, Jesus mugged him. <laughs> he got mugged. He got jumped by Jesus. Jesus jumped him. Jesus showed up, knocked him off of his horse or donkey or whatever he was on, and mugged him. And he says, why are you breathing threats against me? What are you doing? And there was a transformation, not on Paul's account. Paul did not look for it. Paul wasn't on his thing saying, whatever you want me to do, if you want me to be this, I'll be this. I'm just open. He, didn't, he wasn't saying that. He was saying, you give me a chance and I'll kill every one of them. I mean, he was mad. And Jesus mugged him. Right there, Jesus mugged him and said, listen, you're not going to do that. As a matter of fact, I'm going to make you blind so that you can't see to prove to you that I am. If me showing up in the desert isn't enough for you, 
I want you to know that I love you and I've got a plan for your life. And Jesus mugged him right there. And there was a transformation that began happening in Paul's life from that point on. Now listen, there was an event that started the transformation, but the transformation was a process. And we see that played on in the next parts of the scriptures when you find that scripture in Acts when it talks about uh, Paul's conversion. We see that there was an instance that he was knocked off this horse and Jesus appeared to him. That was, a, that was a transformational event. But the transformation happened in a process in his life when he began to understand that Jesus was who he says he was and he began to desire more of God and know more of God. Okay, it, it helped that he was blind for a while. But can I tell you, God will do anything that he needs to in your life to get your attention. He will do whatever he needs to because more than him being interested that you have all your legs and all your hands and always healthy and always happy and everything going wonderful in your life, we read these doctrines that God always wants us healthy and always wants us great. We, he does, but more than that, he wants your heart healthy. He wants your life great. And if you continue to stray away from him and ignore him and don't tend your garden, he will bring events to your life to bring you back to that place to let you know that I love you and I'm more concerned about your heart than I am your body. I'm more concerned about your heart than I am your happiness. He wants your heart and he will go to no extreme and no extent to bring you back to who he is. That ought to scare some of us, but at the same time, let us know that we have a God that is so passionate about us that he will not give up, he will not quit. No matter what you do, smoke it all, swallow it all, drink everything you wanna drink, be with everybody you wanna be with, let me tell you, at the end of the day, God still loves you. He still wants your heart. He still is intent in you coming back to know him. Let me keep going. We see this transformation. Jesus planted the seed in Paul, but it was up to Paul to tend to his garden. In the second part of this scripture here, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go pretty quickly on through here. The second part, we see that Paul had a desire to know Christ. Look down here. Uh, where did I stop reading? Verse, um, um, let, me, let me start at verse number eight. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, Remember what he, not having a righteousness that comes from me knowing the law, being brought up in the right family, going to the right church, that's not what it is. It's not that righteousness that which is through, but that is, but that which is through Christ Jesus, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. He's saying the righteousness that I boast in is what Jesus did on the cross. Because when God looks down at me, he doesn't say, wow, look at this guy. He's got a lot of money. Wow, look at this guy. He's got the right education. He came from a great family. But he looks down and says, hey, look at that guy. He's covered by the grace and by the righteousness of my son, Jesus Christ, because Jesus died on the cross. His blood applies to my life. He sees me through the love of his son is what he's doing here, and that's what he's talking about. Verse number 10, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. And he's just basically saying here, I want to know Christ. I want to know him. Even if it means going through suffering, I want to know him. And he, he gives this last thing here to attain to the resurrection from the, let me back up, becoming like him in his death and so somehow to attain to the righteousness or the resurrection from the dead. He's just basically saying, listen, I want to know Christ even in his, even in his sufferings, even in that and if, if I go through enough sufferings and I'm willing to do that, I know that the same power that raised Christ from the dead will also raise me from the death. Because if I go through those sufferings, I know that he is able to pull me out and deliver me. Even if it's after death, he is able to resurrect me. That's what he's saying in the scripture. But I like this passion of Paul that just says, I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ. I want to know him. Not my parents' Christ. Not my grandma and grandpa's Christ. Not my preacher's Christ. I want an encounter with Christ myself, my own. Can I say again, we can help you plant the seeds, but you're going to have to nurture those. You're going to have to water it. 
The way you know Christ is to have that desire and allow that desire to be watered and to well up inside of you, to have that desire to come close to Christ and know him and connect with him stronger than you ever connected with him before. That's Paul's spiritual rhythm. He's, he's showing you what his spiritual rhythm is. Ruth Haley Barton wrote a book called Sacred Rhythms. I read the book. It really impacted my life and is part of the inspiration of this series that I'm doing here. In an interview for that book, I love what she said because she said there are three things that help us to tend to these gardens. I've written these things down, and I want you to write them down too. Three things that help tend your spiritual garden. Number one is this, arranging our lives for spiritual transformation. Let me pull this up. I want to read you this, this quote. Arranging our lives for spiritual transformation. Here's what she says. This points to the fact that we really can't arrange our lives for spiritual transformation rather than, listen, relying on random and haphazard approaches to the most important area of our lives. Many of us have more clearly developed plans for our finances, for our future education, for home improvements or physical education than we do our spiritual lives. Come on, tweet that. That's extra. I know I'm abusing that phrase, but it's kind of fun to do it. So what Ruth Ailey Barton here is saying that we spend more time organizing the frivolous things, the things that are fleeting in our lives than we do the spiritual things of our lives. Well, then how about arranging our lives to prepare us for spiritual transformation? Arranging our schedules to prepare us for spiritual transformation. So making a plan in your daily life that I am gonna tend my garden, I'm gonna take care of the needs of my life, of my spiritual needs. I'm gonna go spend time in nature. I'm gonna spend time with my family. I'm gonna spend time fostering these things that I enjoy, that make me feel close to God. Listen, I had a period of time in my life that every day, every time I had a day off, I would go find an art gallery or a museum in Tulsa or a, a, in the spring, I love to walk through nurseries. I'm not talking about little kids' nurseries, which would be a fun thing, but I'm talking about gardening nurseries. I love to walk through and see plants and see roses. I've even been known to stop and, and look at a rose, and I mean, it brings a tear to my eye sometimes. It's just the beauty and the, I don't know, there's just something about that. I love walking through and looking at art. I love enjoying that. I feel close to God when I walk through and see that kind of stuff. But we have to plan that to nurture our spirit. And it's not an unspiritual thing to do. It's a spiritual thing for us to go and accept that and let that come inside of us and make a transformation. Are you guys all right with that? Are you understanding this? Is that, is that making sense? Here, here's the second thing she says. says Self-examination. We have to take time to look at ourselves and examine our hearts. Do I have a desire to meet God? Do I have a desire to spend time with him? Or is my desire of God fleeting? Is it pushing away? Is it, is it moving away? Do I have a desire to get to know him? Is my desire to, for him based upon the expectations of people who are around me? Do I feel more guilt than I do release and presence and love and acceptance from Christ? Then I need to work on that and begin to find Christ in the things in my life. Now you can say, listen, I have no desire for Christ. I'm only here because my boyfriend or girlfriend brought me or mom and dad made me or a spouse is here and I, I, that's the only reason I'm here. And I understand that. And thanks for being honest if that's the way you're, you're feeling right now. But can I tell you, Christ wants you so close to him and he wants you so bad that he will begin to pull on your heart. He will begin to let you feel his presence. And all of a sudden, you're gonna start seeing him in places. You're gonna start experiencing him in places. Yesterday, as I was doing this funeral for Dwayne Roper, if you don't know Dwayne, he's a big, burly guy. He was very, just a gentle giant, though, but he taught in our Sunday school department. He taught at our kids' service. He was just a great guy. He loved being around kids. And as we were waiting for the service to start, there was a little girl that, was very outgoing and very active. She was a relative of Dwayne's, and uh, she was sitting on the front row, and uh, I got to talk with her, and it's the, you know, the granddad thing in me. It was kicking in, and I just had fun talking with her, and she said, what is that? And I said, this is my Bible. She says, this is your book. I said, yeah, this is my Bible. What's that? And I said, well, this is God's, God's word. And I said, um, she said, well, what are you going to do with it? I said, I'm going to read a scripture. Which one? Okay, so I showed her Psalms 23. 
And I said, why, why don't, can you read this? And she says, yeah, I've never read a Bible before. I said, well, great, this will be your first time. And I let her read that scripture. And then I said, hey, will you come up during the service and read that for everyone in front of everyone? Sure, she'd love to. She's excited. She wanted to sit on the platform with me. And I would let her, I didn't mind. But she came up, this little 10-year-old girl, and stood over this platform. And I just felt it was so keeping with what Dwayne would have wanted. That was just his personality. And she read this, and I was fighting back tears as I thought this little girl for the first time was reading the Word of God. And for a lot of people, I don't know if it even touched them or not, but it did me. And I know that the Word of God will get inside that little girl's heart and transform her because I've seen it happen too many times and because God cares too much about you to let those moments pass. So it's important that we look at our own lives. Number, number three in that is our Sabbath rhythm. It's the fourth commandment in the Bible in Deuteronomy 20. Actually, this commandment is part of the 10 commandments, the big 10, God's top 10. It's number four of God's top 10. And there was actually more scripture written about this one passage. This one fourth commandment is longer than any other commandment. As a matter of fact, when it says, thou shalt not murder, that's all it says in that verse, thou shalt not murder. If you wanna memorize some scripture or memorize a short one, Jesus wept is a good one, okay? But this one is good too. Thou shalt not murder. That's it. That's all you got to memorize. Just one, just one little phrase. But this one is the longest one. And God said more about this one than anyone else. And here's what he said about the Sabbath rest. Remember the Sabbath. It's, this is in Deuteronomy 28. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or your daughter, nor your male or female servants, which we can translate into employees that were with us, nor your animals, nor any foreign resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that was in them, but the seventh, but but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day. Listen to this, and made it holy. What are you saying? This is the essence of spiritual rhythm. God gave us six days to work hard, to accomplish what we do, and that he created a one day that we could use for our Sabbath, that we are to rest on that day. Now, I think a legalistic approach to that is to say, I don't do any work, I don't push buttons. It's some Jewish tradition, they don't push buttons, they don't turn the dial in their oven, they don't exchange any currency, they don't cook anything, they do all that in, in advance. And so that day is sent, and that's awesome. I think that there's beautiful meaning in that. I think that there's great preparation to that. I, I think that's wonderful. But to whatever extent you wanna take it, I think you're okay to do it. But here's what it says. One of the top 10, one of the top 10 says, take one day and make it a day of rest and spend with your family, spend, something, spend doing something that you enjoy. Spend it in, in enjoyment, in relaxation, because that is the spiritual rhythm and that is the physical rhythm that your creator created you to do. This, I work seven days a week, 40 hours a day, or whatever you, you, know, whatever you do. I work seven days a week. I work, I'm a hard worker. I'm out there sweating. And I, bull feathers, okay? Bull feathers, so basically what you're saying is it's okay for me to murder. It's okay for me to commit adultery. It's okay for me to, to be a fornicator. It's what you're saying because you're saying, well, I just work all the time. It's one of God's top 10. He, say that, he says that on one day you don't work. You relax. You take it easy. You spend time developing relationships. Turn the TV off and, and talk with your family. Enjoy the people who are around you because that's the rhythm that I put in your life. And I hope that I'm making some of you uncomfortable because we live in a society that wants to show our worth by the hours that we work and the days we work and how hard we work. And I'm just saying to you that God wants you to have a rhythm to work spending time with him and not just work showing everybody else how cool you are, how strong you are, or how much of a man or woman you are. Are y'all with me? Love ya, love ya. All right, last one, Philippians, last part of this scripture, verse number 12. Know that I have already, not that I've already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ took hold of me. 
Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, I love this, forgetting what is behind me and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Paul is just saying, listen, I am determined that I'm gonna get there. I am determined that I'm gonna go forward. I am determined that there is nothing. I am determined that there is something out there that is greater than me. There's something out there that I have not experienced that's more majestic than anything that I've ever known in my life. God has more for us. What you've experienced is not it. There's more. There's more. There's more. God has more in store for you. I love one of my favorite theologians is Frank Macchia. I don't know if you guys have read his stuff, but if you ever get a chance, do, because he's, he's brilliant. In an article that I got called Groans Too Deep for Words Towards the Theology of Tongues as Initial Evidence, Machia talks about the importance of us experiencing the fullness of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And he just basically says in this article, listen, could it be that there is more out there that we've never known, that we've never experienced? Could it be that there is another dimension of God's presence, that if he is greater than us, if he is beyond our understanding, if he is beyond our intellect, our vocabulary, if there is a, if there is a, a person out there that knows how to create the world in seven days, who knows how to, to, to intricately put plants and animals and people together, if there is a God with this kind of understanding and mentality, isn't it possible that this same God could have another dimension in his presence and of his glory that Christians can find as they press towards him, that they can never reach that pinnacle and hit it and say, man, I finally arrived, you know? I finally came from the right family. I finally got it all together. I finally found the perfect church. I finally found the perfect worship. I finally found the perfect pastor, the perfect building, all that. And when you get there, can I tell you, it's not perfect anymore because you were there and you were imperfect. None of us are perfect. But here's the thing, there's more, there's more. God has more for us. There's a dimension that's beyond what we know. I know a lot of people will say, well, pastor, I don't believe that tongues is the initial evidence for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So I have people say, listen, if I seek the Holy Spirit, if I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, like it says in the second chapter of Acts, does that mean I have to speak in tongues? And I say, absolutely not. Because if that's your attitude, you're never gonna experience it. You know, that's like to say, hey, if I get married, do I have to pay all my wife's bills? Absolutely not. Happy life, happy wife, happy wife, happy life. There will come a process in my relationship with my wife and my getting to know her and my, I will accept anything that she has for me because I love her. And when we make tongues, when we make this one thing, the litmus test for I have it or I don't, when we make it that, what we do is that we we push aside, we eclipse what the Holy Spirit really wants for us. He wants to come in and take us to another level. He wants to come in and let us experience his fullness, a new passion for mission, a new anointing for, for his word and for going out into loving people and, and being more than what we are right now, being extra. He wants us to be extra. That's what he wants. I should have named this me- message extra. I'm using it too much, I know. But can I tell you, when you get to that point that you want God and anything he has for you, it's not gonna matter what else comes with it. And that, and that alone is when you are baptized in the Holy Spirit and when you experience whatever God has for you, whatever comes after that is fine with me because I just want more of him. If you're only focused on tongues, that's all that you're focused on, I doubt it's gonna happen for you. But when I focus upon what God has for my life, that he will fill me with his presence, he will fill me with a new understanding, with a new anointing, and whatever comes out of that, I'm welcoming it because it's part of what his plan is for my life. It's transformation. It happens when you tend your garden. Tend your garden. So my last question is then I'm asked ask Lisa to come up and just share a testimony as, we, as, as we're getting ready to go here. Well, let me just share, let me ask you some questions. So this morning... How are you tending, how are you with tending your garden? Are you tending your garden? Or you just come and get planted and then come back next week and get planted again? How, how do I know? Well, let me ask you this. Do you spend time in your Bible during the week? Do you spend time in prayer during the week? Are you a professional Christian and you know it all and you got it all under control? Can I tell you? There's weeds in your life, all right? There's weeds in your life. 
and the fruit that God has been putting in your life is being destroyed by the things that are around you. Are you neglecting your garden or are you tending it? Is there excitement in spending more time with God or is it just feelings of dread? Are you serving God because you have to or because you want to? Do you serve God out of expectations of others or out of love and appreciation of Christ? What would it take for you to get back to tending your spiritual garden? Whatever it will take, God is willing to go there with you. And I encourage you to tend your spiritual garden. I want my awesome wife to come up and just share a testimony that she shared with me this past week, and I want you guys to hear it. When I was sharing this with Kelly, it was just a couple of nights ago, and when we were talking, I didn't, as I was saying it, I didn't even realize it was there within me as I'm trying to find the words and, and we're sharing with some friends. You see, um, in our house, Kelly and I, we, um, we each have our own tube of toothpaste. Well, I thought this this morning because Kelly asked me to share this this morning just as I was about to brush my teeth. And um, we do because this is my tube. When Kelly picks up my tube of toothpaste, he says, who are you mad at? <laughs> I have an inability to squish it neatly from the bottom to the top. I never have been able to. And he's just like, why, why are you so angry? <laughs> and, but here's the thing that I realized that um, last year in kind of mid-spring, late spring, this was, this was my life. This is what I felt like it looked like. I felt squeezed a little bit angry, a little bit confused, a little bit at the only word I could really find to define it was I just felt at capacity. And the crazy thing was is that everything around me and in my life was going so well. We were in this building. Our church is growing. This place is amazing. My career was at its height. My, my real estate career, I had, man, I had set a goal and I had superseded it and made it and made it into the top three in my office and the top two seats had never been unseated in 10 years. So the only thing up for grabs was number three and I made it there and everything was going so well, yet my life felt like that squeezed tube of toothpaste and I found myself crying in front of some friends saying, I'm just at capacity and I don't know. I don't know what to do. I don't know what is wrong. And I began to realize something about myself. You see, um, we can sometimes chase after things that appear to be good when, and, and this is good. But what I realized is that even church was becoming something that was on my list and I checked it off my list. And I was here, and I worshiped, and I talked, and I did this, and I did that. Now I'm going to get on to my next thing, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. And it all seemed like it was going good, but something was wrong. And it was exactly what Kelly was saying today. I wasn't scheduling anything in my life that was allowing God to transform my life. It became about the doing and actually about chasing the things that I felt like I could find some confidence in. And I didn't know it until it's amazing that my sister-in-law is here today because this happened when I was at her church last year when God began to show me. I, I went to speak to her women's group um, for a night and, and a, a Saturday and I had some conversations with some women there, but the whole time things are happening there and my heart is wide open and I could feel even God doing something in my life as I was speaking to some different people that were there. And the whole time my phone is, it's buzzing. And, and there are people that are mad at me because I'm ignoring them. And, and we're, I, I'm trying to, I'm about to go up to pray and I, I can just, I can hear things going off. And I, I just, I was so conflicted. And when I left that place and I was driving on my way home, I remember saying something out loud in my car that I've never said before after I've gone somewhere to just try and share my heart or my life with people, I remember asking God, God, when do I get to do that again? And what I wanted to do was be around those women. 
I wanted to be back talking with them. I wanted to be praying for them. I wanted to, there were things in my life and I felt God begin to, to work some things in my life until he got me to the place where the thing is, things just aren't slowing down. They're all good. I'm just showing up. I'm doing what I can. And I get myself to this place and I'm just, I can do nothing well, nothing well. And God, in his amazing way of what he does in our life, he opened up some things in front of me. He opened up a way for me to take some rest when I didn't know. He, our, our pastor, he talks about it all the time. You think he just talks about it here? He talks about it at home. You have to have some rest in your life. It's a, it's a commandment by God. You have to do it, but I was never doing it. I was never doing it. But things, again, going so well, it would appear that God is just blessing everything. So why would I even stop? but he'll get us to that place where we can't go on. And here's the thing that happened when I realized that I could schedule in some rest and I could move in some different directions in my life because God was leading me in that way. I became so broken because I didn't even know. I didn't even know I needed it in my life until I had it. I didn't even know that I was dreading coming here on a Sunday that I just was going through the motions that I just, uh, that I just, it was just like something I was just accomplishing or checking off a list. I didn't know that that was me. And I felt so deceived in myself until God began to allow me some rest and allow me to put some time in my schedule and make a decision that I would let him begin to transform and work on my life. And when he did, it changed a level of wanting to seek God. You see, you have to be careful of going through the motions in your life if you're not making time to rest and not setting apart time for God to work in your soul. You won't even know that he's missing. You just won't know because the enemy wants to deceive you. And I got to the core of what I really felt like he was trying to show me. You see, there's been something about work and Work is good. Business makes our world go round. So I am not saying here, everybody change your direction or leave your job. That's not what I'm saying at all. But for me, it did become about that because what I realized and what God was showing me is that I was gaining confidence in who I was going this direction. I was just, I felt like God was blessing me. I was finding a lot of confidence and I have this thing in my life to chase after and find confidence in something that I feel like I can be successful at. And so I was succeeding in a business area and I was chasing that when all the while God is saying, I want you to have confidence in chasing me. I need you to have confidence and allowing me to transform your life life because when he does, when he's the core, when he's the start, when he's our rest, when he's our motivation, when he's our place, it opens up a whole new dimension of worship that he wants in your life and purpose and places that you'll go. I am so excited when I wake up and it's time to come to church or when my phone rings and somebody wants to talk or when somebody needs me, when somebody when before it was just add them to the list and then check them off when you're done. God doesn't want to be added to our list. He wants to be added to our heart, our soul, our day, and be the core of where everything flows from in our life. And when that happens, your world is wide open for God to transform your life in a way you never thought possible. But if you don't allow it to happen, you'll never know it was missing in the first place. He's calling you to a deeper place with him to find confidence and who he is and how he wants to work out your life. And from that, there are going to be some things that are going to open up wide open in front of you. It's exciting to see what could happen in this place as we allow people's lives to be transformed and changed by God. Amen. Amen. Stay here for just a second. Mark, you can come ahead and play. Um, as she was talking, I just felt the Lord say, and I just want to make this one comment and I'll keep going. Be careful because the very things that you use, the very ways that you use to praise God with, the enemy will use those to destroy your life. 
if you enjoy being the guy that's alone and by yourself and spending time, he will also use that to bring temptation in your life. If you're the one who loves music and loves to be out front and loud, loud and love, he'll also use that to put the wrong kind of music in your life because he wants to counterfeit everything that you do. And he will use your spiritual temperament to destroy you if, you, if you'll allow him to. So that same place, that same place that says we have to find rest in him also says, yeah, but you can also be lazy. You can also neglect your family and walk away from everything. You have to know we're going, we have to push towards God. We have to keep focused in what he has for our lives. But I'm just saying to every one of you, my message for you today is this. God loves you unconditionally. And he will not, he will go to, he, he will, he'll go to no extreme. He'll go to, there's no limits on what he will do to reach you and to let you know that. He will go to the furthest degree so only a fool would continue to run from him because you can't get away and he loves you too much and the next message is this take those spiritual temperaments that you have and look at those and pray about those and ask God to help you to connect with him through those temperaments of prayer of solitude of excitement of activism whatever your thing is find those and use those to connect with God Amen. everybody stand with me would you please I want Lisa to just say a prayer over you guys. Um, and um, I, I want to ask God to just begin to help you guys understand how do I take these temperaments and apply them to my life? And this isn't just a one week thing and then we're moving on. This is something we're really focusing in, we're really honing in on because we really want to make this something that we as a church and as people of God really focus on to, to bring transformation in our lives. So I want Lisa just to pray a prayer of blessing, of consecration, of commitment on you guys and uh, allow God to, to do his work in your life. Amen. <clears throat> I want you to think about this before I pray because I just, when Kelly was saying that, I felt this was one more thing to let you know about finding that confidence in him and how I would chase um, business or success because I had confidence there. Here's the thing that the enemy was using against me is that I never felt any kind of confidence that I could be good at being a pastor's wife. I didn't have any confidence in that. And so the enemy would use that against me because he knew that I would gravitate towards where I could find my confidence. And so, and it pulled me away from the exact place where God has wanted me all the time. So he'll use that in your life and he'll twist it when at the root of it, I don't have to have any confidence in being a, a pastor's wife or being any good in it. I just have to have confidence in who God is and what he wants to pour into my life and what he wants to do on a daily basis. And it's the very same for you. God, I pray 